The following is a bonus episode of The Dental Guys. All right, and welcome back to The Dental Guys podcast here at Spear Summit 2018. And uh, once again, John, let's talk some high-level stuff. And yeah. who better mm-hmm. to talk? about high-level dentistry. We want to get clinical, Greg. We want to get clinical. Right. Like, let's get let's clinical. Yeah. Let's get clinical. Yeah, exactly. So we recently got to spend some time with you at Treating the Worn Dentition, which we thought, we think is one of the echelon courses for Spear Education. But, uh, and that was wonderful. It was a great course. All the, you know, everything we wanted, we got yeah, out we of brought that. a lot out of that. We brought yeah. a lot out of that. So. John, tell us a little bit about what we're going to be talking about right now. Yeah, so, you know, we briefly talked uh, yesterday about uh, evolution of dental implant design over the last, you know, 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we kind of jokingly talk about, you know, that's what I call the 90s about <laughs> um, implant design and implant just treatment planning, implant restorative. Right. Yep. Um, and, you know, one of the things that back in the 90s, early 2000s that we were kind of taught was that we should account for bone loss. We should account for a millimeter, 1.5 of bone loss uh, around our implants. And um, the question I want to maybe start with, you know, do you think, and of course this, this directly affects the restorative planning, do you think that it's possible to achieve bone stability around implants uh, long term, over five years, uh, and, and how does that affect the way, if, if so or if not, how does that affect the way that you do your restorative treatment plan? Not just bone stability, though. Bone stability yeah. would be considered to, you know, an old Branamark implant is bone loss to the first third. Right, right. But bone stability it's, to the interface, because right. in, in residency, in my residency training, when we were placing dental implants, we were told to countersink it even further to account so that we would, you know, we would predictably see this happen in the first year yeah and so we, are you seeing that and do you think there's things restoratively or surgically that we can do to minimize changes okay so then we have to go back into the history right the the old Brandenburg style implants it was anticipated and expected to get bone loss to the first thread now what's the impact of that uh, as long as we actually can keep everything else where it is, the impact is almost it's not a problem, right? Because although we get bone loss to the first thread, what really determines our aesthetics is not the bone levels around the fixture, but the bone on the adjacent teeth. Mm-hmm. So even though we mm-hmm. might have some bony topography changes down to the first thread as the biology kind of gets set, um, we can still make really nice predictable restorations and we can have implants that that bone level stays there. So why not place years. external hex? Because it's easier to restore. From a structural design, Mm -hmm. it's a really inferior design. So now everything has gone to an internal connection, horizontal offset, Mm -hmm. platform switch concept, moving that micro gap internally. So now if you start looking at bone levels around fixtures, it is, we don't have the same bony topography remodeling. Mm -hmm. We actually have bone levels now that can actually stay up near the head of the implant and actually maybe even grow beyond that. So you think, well, that's great. You have better aesthetics. The bone levels around the implant, again, do not determine the aesthetics. It's the bone on the adjacent teeth. So we we go to it because we have better biologic interface, Mm -hmm. but we also go to it because structurally now you have a connection that is really machined well and fits together well. So the screw loosening that we had back in the day with the external hex implants, we really don't see screw loosening now. Right. When we do, it's not due to the structure of the implant it's there's other factors it's a contour issue that we that we would anticipate when we mm-hmm. start to see screws coming loose now yeah so, so it's more important maybe with say adjacent implants uh and, and and that discussion starts to come up a little more yeah so adjacent implants where you now have no adjacent teeth mm-hmm. you have uh, no super crestal biology now the ability to hold soft tissue between the implants changes mm-hmm. and now going to you know, I know you just had Dennis Turnow on, and they were talking about the one abutment, one time mm-hmm. concept that mm-hmm. we can actually start to get an attachment, or uh, maybe attachments and adhesion, let's say, right. to two components, and laser lock from BioHorizons mm-hmm. getting an, an adhesion. Historically, been shown 
um, that starts to make sense mm -hmm. because the biology now has changed. But single tooth implant dentistry, if you look at the literature, interproximal papilla height's predictable because it's determined by the teeth. Right. It's the facial bone and facial soft tissue that now is the is the risk. So so it, adjacent implants now interproximal is it can be right. an issue. Right. 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 So mm -hmm. what do you think the restorative things right now we can do to reduce bone loss? I, I don't think there's there, there's a restore. So Riley, I, what your question is, is are there restorative things that actually create cause, bone loss? Cause bone loss. Um, and I, I don't think that there's a restorative issue with creating bone loss. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't think cement's a problem? <laughs> That's a technique issue. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. So I, I, so I understand Ch that. Chan Chandur Wadwani has really opened the eyes of the dental community about the dangers of cementing implant restorations, and he's he's right. It it is catastrophic. So poor technique is the problem. But I believe part. I mean, not every implant restoration that's cemented has problems. Why? Because the operator is is largely uh, valuable on that. The technical side of it, the design of it, and how we cement it are huge factors. So restorative things that we can do to reduce the chance as a clinician right. is proper cementation techniques and restorative design of the abutment position of the margins. I, I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and I think Chandur is right that we should be erring on the side of let's see if we can do more uh, screw retained restorations, mm -hmm. right? Then the then the risk goes off the table. Mm -hmm. The challenge with that is not every implant can be screw retained. More and more with with different uh, types of driver designs and, and channel mm -hmm. offsets mm -hmm. help us get mm -hmm. to there. But given the bony topography, it can impact it's, the it's angulation the of the implant. You, you have to do extra grafting on certain patients with a vestibule that starts to be yeah. under contoured yep. to get the angulation correct or screw tank. So then you start wondering if that's worth it to subject that patient to another procedure. So there are times where we we have to, like we have to do cemented restorations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then what are the things that we could do to minimize that risk? Because it is it is real and it is a big problem. Yeah. So talk us through that. Well, we, you know, uh, Bob and I have always said that in the aesthetic zone, um, a custom abutment is almost a must. Mm-hmm. Now you can take a stock anatomic abutment and you can customize it so that it would look like a custom abutment. So you need to have the ability to be able to get contours to support soft tissue that you would want right. and get that cement margin into a position that's not gonna be two millimeters below the tissue. Right. So using a custom abutment, I can do that. And I can move palatal margins up at the tissue or even super gingival because they're not an aesthetic issue. And I can get the facial margin to kind of follow the contours of the of the soft tissue. So getting it into an accessible area, paramount. Mm -hmm. Using um, an abutment replica, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So indirect dye type. Mm -hmm. of thing. Indirect dye, cement it on the dye, wipe the excess off, put it in the mouth, can minimize. Right. Keeping the screw channel, Teflon tape, but keeping some space. So when you do have excess, instead of it being hydraulically pushed sub gingival, it goes into the the chamber, right? right. It's, like, it's like the old school process where we used to put cement vents, a hole yes. in the ground. Right. Well, yes. you have an internal vent. Cement vent. You just got to use it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this on, on this because this comes back to, to clinical technique. Do you think it's possible to do an abutment design without a customized impression coping? Do you think it's possible in the anterior to have adequate abutment design without that technique being used? So... I've, I always pose this question to Bob because he's, Bob Winter's been in labs, you know, his entire life. And he sees kind of what goes on in the real world because mm -hmm. I'm sheltered and I don't right. see We're the real insulated. world. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So I, I kind of am, am in a controlled environment. And so my question uh, is how many implant, so let's say maxillary anterior aesthetic zone, right? So out of the implants in the aesthetic zone, how many are asking for something screw retained and how many are asking for something cement retained? And he says, by far still cement retained is the primary. That's what we mm -hmm. hear too. Mm -hmm. And so my follow-up question is the one that actually frightens me. And this is why Chandur sees all the problems that he sees. How many of those that are asking for the cement restoration give you a customized impression coping? Yes. yes. And, yes. and, yes. and the number is a single 
digit oh, percentage. We're right. being told at our lab we're the only we're two the people, only people doing out of it. all the people they work with that do it. So now that's fast, they, that's fast forward. It doesn't yeah. matter. So now what? the soft tissue that is on the technician's lab bench, and maybe it's maybe it's a digital, maybe it's an analog on their bench. Right. They are creating a contour. Yes. And they have to have a cement margin somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as you influence the support of the tissue, the tissue is going to move. Yep. But they don't know where it's going to move. And the last thing you want to do is send an abutment with a super gingival so margin. They're <laughs> guessing, right? <laughs> yes. And when they guess, I hope Steve's listening. You to this. will yeah. lose every time if it's too far coronal and yeah. you see the junction. So yep. what do they do? They err on the side of it, yes. being more sub G. And all of a sudden, the reality that Chandur is published on extensively, it is really a problem. And that and, and that's Man. assuming just for a second that they're even provisionalizing to sculpt tissue at a all. Absolutely. Which is never which, happening. Which again, it's it's a standard it, healing abutment. Yeah. Right. With and an impression. Standard impression coping. Yeah. So now you're assuming the technician knows how to adjust the soft tissue to be mm. able to get the contours. So well, yeah, I think it's one of the it's, major problems it's major. that we have with anterior implants. Right. I mean, I think it's, if not the major problem, it's, it's, it's probably top five major problem because this is what is causing, really giving implants a bad name, I feel like, in the anterior. From, from an aesthetic standpoint, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and mm -hmm. maybe even from a, from a failure standpoint, yep. from a cement yes. oh, issue. Absolutely, all, all the way across the board. Yeah, totally agree. Hmm. So we've talked a little bit about the restorative things, but really restorative does drive implant therapy and placement you know, there's a certain wax up, whatever, you know, we look at restorative design. What surgically can we do to reduce bone loss today? Well, so, I mean, maybe I'm not the best one to answer that because well, but, but, I, I am not a I know surgeon. you're not a surgeon. Yeah, but, but you know but kind, you of, know what kind of what the thought process, process is. Think, like if you, you know, we all learned as restorative clinicians, all three of us are restorative clinicians by going to surgery and mm -hmm. actually hand-holding our surgeons sometimes. You know? I mean, is that true? Do we is have that, to do that sometimes? Do we have, um, you have to communicate with the surgeon. Well, that's yeah. communication, going so, there and handholding, <laughs> grabbing their some, rear some, end and saying, so, Some people I'm might need to be out. held uh, <laughs> a little bit tighter than others. <laughs> I would go with that. Yeah. <laughs> like, good job. That's a nice diplomatic you know? answer. But, that's you know, good. Digital, digital guides to communicate, analog guides to communicate, physically being there to make sure that one of those is used might be valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but the communication is, is paramount. Because you, you, you talked about we talked about a little bit about this before is that when you insulate yourself in a controlled environment like mm -hmm. john and i have very specific people that we like to work with because they know our protocols and when they place an implant it's done properly but the world that we also live in is that of things that hey you refer it out and that patient doesn't go to who you want right. and they because they talked to sally at the soccer game and sally had her implant placed right. by surgeon b Right. And so, then this, so then this walks back in, and you're faced with real challenges sometimes. Yeah, so w what's interesting is, again, we started with our discussion being um, the evolution mm -hmm. of implant mm -hmm. designs, but there's also been an evolution of implant positioning. Because when implants, when I was being trained in implants in, in the early 90s, the idea was get the implant as far facial as you can. This was also the same time period we started having tapered implants mm. and different sizes of implants. And so we thought, let's fill the socket. Yeah, I did that. Right? Yes. Bigger implants. Don't make me show those post bring it. pictures. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so our idea was smoothing the, the dental gingival emergence profile off of the implant. Yeah. You have the same cases that we do. Yeah. Did you watch these over time and you got, start to get bone loss yeah, and you start to get news. soft tissue changes. Yeah, I'm seeing zirconium abutments show up now. So mm -hmm. what what the evolution has been is, you know, positioning things more palatal, anticipating the bony changes that will occur when you take the tooth out. And then doing some sort of contour addition. There's all sorts of, of different ways to be able to enhance the buccal contour. Right? Mm. So whether it's hard tissue, whether it's soft tissue, whether it's a socket shield technique, but there's ideas that we know that the bony topography and the soft tissue can change. Mm -hmm. But what I think the surgeons need to realize is, and, and Jim, when he was teaching uh, the grad students in Perio, I think we talked about this before. Yeah, yeah. He gets, gave them a, a, a restorative manual said learn this mm -hmm. because the implant positioning will impact what the restorative dentist can do absolutely that's awesome 
but even though Jim and I know how how that works, you know, we used to practice in the office like one day a month we'd get together and we'd do implant patients. And inevitably he would call me into his room and he would say, Greg, okay, I know we talked about the positioning being X, Y, Z, but once I got in here, it looks a little different than I anticipated, which means that I have to change one of our variables, right? So it's depth, angulation, mesial, distal, buccal, lingual. Mm -hmm. But he knows that when he changes it, it's going to impact me. Mm -hmm. And he, so what he wants to do is he wants to get my okay. That if I soon see it in my practice and there's a problem, it's like, well, you okayed it. So right. you owe now part you of this problem. This. Yeah, yeah. But we use the position, if we have to change the variable of, let's say, angulation, then maybe we change the depth or maybe we change it palatally. So it gives me a little more running room to mm -hmm. make the accommodations that we need. Yeah, I know that when we go to the AO, we hear some speakers say that implant placement today from a surgical perspective is not based on millimeters today. Mm. Um, it's based on tenths of a millimeter mm -hmm. in placement because one degree of angulation off could totally change your prosthetic running room and contours. Especially if we're ending up shallow. When you have a, a when you can't accommodate a position and now it's a little bit on the more shallow side, we really struggle. Right? Yeah. And, and the, the reason that the struggle becomes more real is with the new design of fixtures, having an internal connection, mm -hmm. there's a certain distance of room off the fixture that I can't use. That's, That's right. right. That's right. We right. always emerging. want to stay real narrow. Right. So now there's almost a millimeter of running room that is unusable because of to the me. screw access channel yeah it's screw access channel but and the just, emergence just, just the getting emergence, out of the implant getting out of the implant. right yeah so it it is it's it can so, be problematic so the day of surgery um you know this implants place and i want to talk a little bit about as you're starting to develop soft tissue um you know of course we just heard tarnow talk a little bit about you know dual zone socket technique placing immediate provisionals grafting at time of surgery using the provisionals graft containment um, how, how important is it to take an indexing impression at time of surgery? Do you do that? Are you, you making provisionals, you know, from the day of surgery, either taking a scan or uh, an, an indexing impression the day of so that you have something ready if it cannot be immediately loaded or if you're not going for immediate loading? Is that something you ret routinely are doing? Yeah, so I, I mean, again, I work with Jim Janikowski, super talented periodontist. We're not in the same city. Yes. Uh, we are... 21 miles apart or in Seattle times two hours uh, of traffic yeah so we have to have a line of communication that says okay how are we going to manage yeah. this patient and what we look at is we look at bone position facial bone interproximal bone which basically supports facial tissue and interproximal tissue and we put together a plan so if we have a nice anatomy or something that we can augment at the same time our goal is typically to do something to support the soft tissue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that could mean and an immediate provisional. So volume maintenance is key. It's uh, soft tissue maintenance starts the day the surgery happens. Right. And yeah. it and it doesn't end there. So either. is it the surgeon's responsibility to to learn how to, to, to learn, learn how, how to do, do that? To learn how to do that. Um, it's it depends on the relationship with the surgeon and the surgeon's but in your situation, time and skill. Because we have listeners that do exactly what you have. They refer two hours away. Yep. Right. That's my situation. I'm in a yeah. small town, and every if I want to get to my periodontist, it's an hour. Right. You know, so yeah, so how so how do you, how are you handling those types of things? So you you know you have a couple of options. One option would be if your surgeon has restorative skills, or maybe they've done some additional training. So in our implant workshop that Bob and I do, we traditionally have two or three surgeons that come with their restorative colleagues because they know that if there's things that they can do, especially if there's a logistical issue, if they can do things to start start supporting and helping to shape tissue, the patient's going to be better off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the surgeon can do it, but they have to have the skills and we have to help them if they don't have the materials to get in their hands the right materials to polish, to shape, to cure, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. Or the patient's going to come back to us. Mm -hmm. right? Or, so that's, that's second, or it's so much pre-prosthetic planning that you can have pieces set before Pre you even begin. Yeah, so fully guided surgery. So you end up having some options. Mm -hmm. So going back to your idea about indexing, that could be a way that I can actually do the work without actually having to see the patient until I'm done. Right. Mm. So they see, they see the surgeon, they do something, they start to maybe support the tissue, but they don't do much. Maybe they just put a conventional, uh, conventional healing weapon on. If they index it and they 
courier up to me the impression at the index, mm -hmm. I can actually pour that cast. I can fabricate something on the cast and I can see the patient the next morning. Mm -hmm. Right, and you're inside that, that time window surgically where- Where you can, you can, you can get in. It's, it's four safe. days inside of this time where the, the things haven't reconnected yet. Yeah. And it's basically still the same day. So you, yeah, you just need Fresh. to have that communication on mm -hmm. which route are we going to go. I think mm -hmm. that's good stuff to hear. But, but here's the challenge. The challenge is, let's say we're going to, we're going to do an immediate provisionalization. Mm -hmm. And Jim, who used to be a restorative dentist, I'm very comfortable with him doing that for me. Yeah. He likes to do it, he enjoys to do it, and he, he does it well. So if you don't have to send him to me to do it, and you like to do it, and you can Great. do it to my level, I'm happy to have you do it. But it depends on if we can get primary stabilization of mm -hmm. the fixture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can't. So you always have to have a fallback. You always have to have a plan B. But your plan B also, from a clinical real world standpoint, can't be super expensive yep. and labor intensive. Because you might throw it in the trash. Because it might not even be applicable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so what we've kind of always relied upon is, since again, we're, we're far apart in our offices, is I will send, um, if need be, I'll send whatever he wants, but I'll send an Essex. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Essex uh, is made with two goals. One is if you can't get primary stabilization and you can't make an, uh, an immediate implant, squirt some provisional material in it, the patient has something to replace the tooth and they're gonna see me the next day and I'll do whatever I need to do. Yep. If the implant actually can go in and he can make an immediate provisional, they're still going to be wearing this, mm -hmm. okay? Because patients soon forget they just had surgery. So they start abusing, they abuse it because it looks and feels like a natural tooth, especially for using maybe the natural tooth in mm -hmm. the provisional. So it's just a reminder for them that there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, because you can remove it from occlusion, right? You can remove their ability to get on it in centric or in the pathway or in the edges, but they can eat with it. Right. And they can be chowing into pizza and bagels and they're putting a ton of stress and strain and all of a sudden it doesn't integrate. Mm. So we can use it as a reminder. You know, it's kind of, it's a retainer. But here's the thing, when you fabricate it, you have to have that designed differently. Right? Mm -hmm. Essex types, you know, clear retainers fit really well. Really tight. Well. Too now well. imagine, imagine them yeah, putting this thing yeah, on That's making me nervous as you were right. saying that. I was like, how are you making so this? So we design it and we actually design an overbuild on the on the cast, overbuild that tooth. So you're blocking out your, yeah. it's just. So it mm -hmm. fits really intimately everywhere else and it's a little bit bigger. Loose. Nice. So mm -hmm. it's just covering it. I like and the that. patient's wearing this essentially 24 hours? It's an or insurance policy. It's an insurance policy yeah, that, yeah. you know, I want them to have it and I'll maybe tell them to put it in. Um, and if they have it and they remember they're gonna put it in, there's a reason why they're putting okay. it in, right? So it's always in their it's mind. It's a mental reminder. It's a mental reminder. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I've had too many patients come back and I go to unscrew it and I pull yes. the tooth and the implant out together. I'm like, well, this, is, this is not good. That's a bad, That's a bad day. day. That's <laughs> a very Stick bad it back in. <laughs> so you have, need yeah, to go back to the surgeon. So are you right. having them wear that for the first, uh, say, six weeks? Um, I'm having them just have it around and I want them to put it in, you know, and, and I'll Throughout the day. You know, throughout yeah. the day. Yeah. So but it's, again, it's not really as important as for the... It's just a reminder. It's for their it's mind to reminder know. that something happened. Mm. Because you know, what's, you know what you're telling me here is that most of the post-operative discomfort with implant therapy, especially single unit, and even full arch, but single unit therapy, what we're talking about, the pain and discomfort is with today's surgeries. It's minimal. It's very it's minimal. 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 They're so always like, amazed, aren't they? They, they're they're they, they hit the ground running. And like, they forget. Hey, I'm back to normal. Right. I'm good. I got my tooth back. In they fact, forget. their pain is often better right. than what it was before if they had a problem. So what about in the posterior? Okay. So mm. let's take this idea of, uh, you know, soft tissue development or maintenance. How important is that? John and in, I disagree on this. Yes, we, we kind of do. About how important is that in the posterior? Say we've got an immediate molar. Uh, you know, immediate implant placed into a molar socket uh, or premolar socket. Yeah, and let's go premolar because molar is a more challenging given the topography okay. of the of the tooth and the implant. You, you typically enough. put it in the where the only bone is, right? Because you have a correct. It's coming. It's coming in here. So premolar. So premolar. A premolar. And and how important is uh, you know custom abutment or custom? I should say custom tissue former type of idea there. How the often are of you surgery. doing that at the time <laughs> of surgery, or is that something where you say you know let's not be as concerned there? You know, <laughs> where does the aesthetic zone stop and where does it start? 
Yeah, like, and that's kind of what I'm asking is how, how far do I, you take it? I believe in implant dentistry, soft tissue is important throughout the mouth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But is it from an aesthetic standpoint? Maybe not in the molar area, maybe not in the lower arch, but I still think it is because I'm going to photograph everything and I want it to look, I don't, but, I don't want you to look at it and go, that's an implant. No, right. I want it to, I want it. So to the nth degree, yes, shaping tissue is important for everything, but that doesn't mean you have to go to a provisional to do it. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a lot of different ways I can shape soft tissue and yet not have the risks of doing, let's say, an immediate restoration on right, it. So right, right. So custom tissue form. Custom, custom healing above, but custom tissue former can be made analog or digital. Great. So you're, you like connective tissue is what you're saying. I like <laughs> soft tissue for sure. Not yes. I, I think. Thank you. You're on my side. <laughs> I, I think soft tissue and implant dentistry is the key. It right. is. And so soft you, tissue volume, mass. So an immediate premolar, you're typically going to make some type of custom healing abutment day of surgery right. if it, in all in almost any case if you can. Or, or or shape it at some point in time. Right. Or come back to it Correct. and and reestablish we're, that. We're always going to address it. The the timing of when is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's case by case dependent, but it's going to be addressed. And the amount of time that that takes is not that much. You know, it's, 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 it's Oh, it, no, for like a custom healing former, it's right. not that much. Yeah. And, and actually manufacturers have helped us to yes. make it even more efficient because depending on the implant company you can actually go into a catalog now and you can actually get anatomic shapes yes. yeah. of healing abutments that you could pick different sizes to kind of get you closer to where you need to be yeah. with no work can, no work so whatsoever you can air braid them and then add composite and if you needed to you could air braid them as long i mean peak material is yeah. hard to do but right. if it's if it's a metal former yeah for sure you can right. you could air braid and you could put some retention on it well, so you feel like that soft tissue is important because one, you're using your cases as examples and you like to take things to the nth degree. That's great. Mm -hmm. But is, does it matter five years out that you did that? Like, are you seeing five years plus that there's a real benefit to the soft tissue around? You're talking about stability? Stability. Like the more tissue that you have? So, I, so then that's not a shaping issue because our comments before were on shaping the right, soft tissue. Right, right, right. It's a volume Aesthetic. issue. Yeah, yeah. Volume. It's a volume issue. Mm -hmm. The more soft tissue you can get, the more long-term predictability you're so going to have. So do it when you can. Do it when you can or how, however you choose to, right? You know, with right. the dual zone technique, it's a different approach. Right. Um, very fascinating information. And the cases that, uh, that Tarnell and you showed were phenomenal. Right. Um, but it's not the approach maybe that other teams use. And right. that's okay. There's more than one way to get to that endpoint. But mm -hmm. facial volume is, is what it's you critical. really, it's critical for long-term success. Because Jim is, Jim is more about connective tissue grafting, We're, right? we're more soft that's, tissue. Yeah. yeah. Now, we, and we, we have cases where we've done hard tissue, more of a Danny Buser technique. Mm -hmm. We have cases where we've done like auto... Uh, Otto Zur and Marcus Herzler mm -hmm. uh, socket mm -hmm. shield yeah. technique. Mm -hmm. sure. And all techniques can be done predictably as long as you choose the correct technique for said patient. I completely I agree. agree with I that. think it's all about knowing case selection. Case it's, selection. Case, it's case selection. Case selection. How, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's, it's like supporting soft tissue. Intuitively, people hear supporting soft tissue and they think it's an immediate temporary. Well, that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. I could, I could custom healing former, right? Custom healing abutment. I could use a bonded tooth with a wire to have an ovate shape to support the papillae. It's yeah, so there's, there's so there's many so ways many I ways. can do it. So I will say, let's choose the way that's most predictable for this patient. Right. There's a lot to understand here restoratively for a surgeon and the communication with your surgeon, no matter how great the distance, mm -hmm. just like with a lab technician, that's no different. Right. Absolutely. It's no different. And it's pre-planning it's pre-operative like don't just send your patients to a surgeon yeah. and say put an implant, put an implant, implant number absolutely. seven that's yeah. that's not a good idea right and um the communication has to be there john yeah. i want to ask you about um scanning and implants um where do you see the use of that you know we talked earlier about um you know, indexing, for instance, and I know some people are using scanners for kind of a similar idea, you know, place the implant, scan, have a scan body place, yep, you know, scan same body, idea. Scan post, yep. It seems like the challenge with scanning with implants or one of the challenges is with tissue collapse, you know, kind of similar to what we're talking about with customized impression copings. Do you think that we can be good enough with scanning or maybe quick enough with scanning to where we can actually capture soft tissue? It seems like it's a real challenge. Um, it's the, so, if we're going to be in the digital realm, 
or we're going to be in the analog realm, the same problems exist. It's, it's where do, what contours do I need to create to support the soft tissue? So we can do it as well, or maybe let's say even better in the digital realm. Hmm. But that means that the thought process is still the same. On, my, on the monitor now, I'm going to create an emergence profile because you're right, whether you're doing it analog, I'm not fast enough to make an impression so the tissue doesn't collapse. Right. I'm not fast enough to scan it and the scanner can't actually see to the head of the fixture, especially if it's countersunk mm -hmm. below facial gingival margin, three to four millimeters. Yep. So on the digital workup now, I'm creating that emergence profile. Same thought process of stay as narrow as we need to or as we can until we start to get up to the contours of the tooth. But it's a guess. But it's it, always a guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And as you go through patients, you guess better, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whew. But you what? air you again you air you <laughs> That's air a show title coming from better. Greg can, coming from Greg Wait Kinzer. I don't, I don't think, think I would ever, ever expect Greg that. to say yeah you guess better over time. So 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 yes okay so maybe that wasn't the best terminology. So yesterday Marcus Blouts talked about uh, evidence based research. Sure. What does that really mean? Yeah. Is it truly just an evidence based that we're going to go to a piece of literature knowing that the literature can get dated really quickly? Yeah. Um, a big part of that also is experience, clinical Absolutely. experience. Repetition. I'm only giving you a hard time. Uh, no, I know, we know, we but know. But that's, I mean, that's, that's valuable. But you also need to know where to error, how to mm. error. So I don't know. If Great point. You guys, you guys mentioned golf, so I'm assuming you're maybe golfers. Well, this guy is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you know that when you're golfing, you know where you want to miss. Mm -hmm. If mm. I'm not going to hit it perfectly, I don't want to be there because I'm I know I'm my tendencies. Jail. So, mm -hmm. same is true with implants and soft tissue. You err on being under contoured. Right. Mm. So if you're under contoured, you always have a second shot to change the contour and manipulate the tissue to fit your that's, needs. That's good advice. If you start too big, you can lose the game before you even begin. That's so important. I think that's the key with anything with implants is under contouring in the end. I yes. mean, with For provisionalization, sure. with final, with cement, with all of these things. And we're all you're accepting about. is that I'm just going to add something to the button. Right. I'm not going to remake it entirely. Right. It's just a. It's just kind of a send back, modify it in this way, and and then we'll be good. Yeah. So the yeah. benefit of being digital is we talked about customizing and impression coping. That's the analog version of. I like the provisional contours. I like the support that it provides. And I want to transfer that over as accurately as I can to the technician. Mm. If you're in the digital realm and you've actually digitally fabricated a healing abutment, a custom provisional uh, that was immediately placed, and you look at the tissue and you go, it's phenomenal, it's perfect. Mm. So the contours that are supporting it are perfect. Yep. You actually can get that same contour now Great point. 100 so percent awesome yep. you already have it as a digital file and Man. that's what we're that's doing that's what we're doing so and that's i mean you you that. are even more accurate because yeah, in the amazing. analog wor yeah. world you can get close mm -hmm. right in the digital world i can be 100 percent. and that's, that's what we're doing that's we're, what we're, we're, doing. we're making you know non-indexed custom tissue formers based on the ct cross section yep. of the root and then, you know, we're not always right on them. We're not always perfect, but, it's but sometimes close. we are. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you just say, give me that and add a tooth, you know? It's pretty, it's pretty yeah. amazing. It's pretty amazing and, yeah. and, the, and efficient, right? Oh, Super yeah. efficient. Oh, yeah. So we, we started this whole conversation. Now that's what I call the 90s. <laughs> what we're talking about here, Greg. This is right now. This is right now. Sure. So how much really have we changed since the 90s? Because I, I graduated in 03, started in 99. And you were before that a little bit, a little bit, and uh, but you were in the '90s when you started learning, right? right? A lot about these things. What's different? I think basic concepts are still valid, right? It's all conceptual. Mm -hmm. So the basic concepts of implant position have changed a little bit. The implant designs have changed a lot, mm -hmm. but soft tissue, our reliance upon soft tissue, I think, is is profoundly different than what we thought before. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and maintaining and supporting and all that, that so from a restorative standpoint, our, our role with implant dentistry is soft tissue. I yep. just need to have the soft tissue to be able to work with. Mm. That's, that pretty much says it, Wes. I hey, mean, it's perfect. That's what we've been talking about a lot in the last couple of years, especially. And um, this is, this has given us some things to really chew on. And I think a lot of people that are, you know, we talked about this just a little bit ago. It's just, you know, if you just take a couple of these things, and you bring them and you know of course we've got to plug 
that we've got to plug the fact that you guys are teaching this. Obviously, you know, you're teaching this in a much more comprehensive, much more systematic way. I mean, we don't really even have to plug it. I mean, everybody knows this is what you do. Um, and, you know, having gone to workshops and seminars, you know, we, we appreciate the fact that you're taking the, the basic research. John, we and know we love, and no, you know, we love spear. Yeah. And you're trying to, <laughs> and you're turning it into systems and systems is what we need. We need yeah. systems. And, and actually what, what Bob and I do, in fact, Bob is the one that does the, the hands-on pieces and in the implant workshop in particular, there's 18 different exercises that we do. Hmm. And you go, well, geez, I mean, immediate provisional, that's just one. What, mm. what the heck are you guys doing? <clears throat> we talked about it before, case selection and applying the appropriate treatment for the case. There's, my goal is always the end point. I'm looking at the end point. That's the restorative driven treatment plan. In order to get to the end point, I might choose a different technique because it has less risk for whatever I'm seeing. So I need to give you a lot of tools to be able to use. And then you pick the one that a, maybe you have more comfort with, or right. B, will get you to the end point more predictably. predictable. Yeah, fits the case. It's good, John. It's good. Hey, if you're listening to this right now and you're interested in learning more about dental implant therapy and how to restore and even maybe bring a surgeon out, head over to Spear Education's website and check out some of their implant restorative uh, design uh, seminars and workshops. Um, I think that uh, you'll not be disappointed. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, like and follow us on Facebook, all those things, you know. And uh, yeah, and Greg, you, if, thank you very Greg, much for being on the hey, show. Listen, happy to do it. Thanks, if guys. If you have let's, questions, let's chat, let's chat again. We, I mean, we definitely will absolutely. hit you up again. So thank you so much for listening. For Greg, John, I'm Wes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to that bonus episode of The Dental Guys. If you want to connect with us, check us out on thedentalguys.net or hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. Thanks for listening.